this is your first time here at Trailhead, uh, we occasionally do a series of messages where we actually read through a book of the Bible together, and then we come together and talk about what we're reading. So we just read one chapter a day, we make it really simple, one chapter a day, and then at the end of the week we come together and talk about something from those seven chapters that we have read. So we are in 1 Samuel right now, and this week we read yeah. chapters 8 through 14. Uh, so if you haven't read that, you can just pretend we'll never go. Um, you can act like you read it. But what we're doing as we walk through Samuel, we're walking through First and Second Samuel, is we are just calling this series of messages Game of Thrones. And again, if you weren't here last week, you may not have heard me say this, but I have never seen the show Game of Thrones. I have no idea what that is all about. So this series has nothing to do with Game of Thrones. Um, it actually is talking about uh, the, the thrones in our heart. We have a throne in our lives that it kind of is this revolving thing that drives us at different times. So at one moment, your heart may be driven by love. You may be looking at a person that you care about, that's your spouse or whoever, and you think, wow, I love this person so much. And you're kind of being driven by love for a minute. And then five minutes later, they do something that really frustrates you or upsets you. And all of a sudden that changes, right? So the throne of your life switches over and you're being driven by frustration or by anger or whatever it is. At times our lives are driven by the things of God. And we look up and we think, man, I just want to follow God and I want to do the things that he wants me to do. And then 10 minutes later we look up and say, yeah, but right now I kind of want to do what I want to do for a few minutes. And our, our hearts shift from being driven by God to being driven by the things of us and selfishness. And that kind of stuff. And so really the question that we're asking as we walk through Samuel is how do we get to a point of consistency and clarity where instead of having this revolving game of thrones in our lives, we have stability in the things that are leading us and that are directing us and that are guiding us. So that's the big question that we're asking as we walk through this series um, over the next few weeks. Let me ask you guys a question as we get started. And it, you may not want to confess here. If you don't want to confess, that's okay. But how many of you before the age of like 12 had the thought of running away or you actually tried to run away? Anybody actually do that? Yeah, a few of you actually will admit it. Okay, so when I was like six, I don't remember, it, six or seven, somewhere in there. My dad did something, and I have no idea what it was now, but at the time, it was a really big deal, and I got really upset with my parents because they were telling me what to do, and I didn't want them to tell me what to do, and I got mad at them, and I remember going into my bedroom, and I had a suitcase that was stayed in my closet, so I pulled that suitcase out, and I started just packing it with whatever. And I have no idea what I put in there. I'm sure it was like stuffed animals, you know, in a blanket or whatever. Probably one pair of socks. Nothing that was actually going to help me a whole lot in the long run. But I'm packing all my stuff, and I shut my door, and, and my dad comes and knocks on the door and then walks in, and he sees this bag in the middle of the room that I'm packing because I'm out of here, right? And he asked me, he said, you going somewhere, John? <laughs> you know, and I, at that moment, it kind of hit me. Well, yeah, but I don't know where yet. You know, I'm just getting away from you. That's all I know. I, I don't want to be around you anymore. So I packed all of my bags, and, and I was ready to go. But the thing that I was really saying in that moment was I was saying, I want to have some control here. Dad, you're always telling me what to do, and I want to make some decisions sometimes. I want to have control. I think if any of you were in that situation where, as a kid, you're running away, that's probably the issue, right? I want Control. I want to be able to have a say in this matter. I want to be able to, to direct the, the place that we're going to um, as a family. That's the, the issue for me, anyway, when I was a kid and I wanted to run away. And that's not common. I mean, that's not uncommon for us. All of us have this issue in our lives where we have the, the issue of control that takes over at times. And we're just born this way. I mean, if you have kids, you know this. We have three kids, and I remember, especially with the younger two, when the older sibling would come, and I mean, this is before the younger one can even walk. She'd be sitting on the ground. She's not crawling, but she could sit there, and if she had a toy that the older one is trying to take, she was like a magician. You know, she's like behind the back and under the legs and 
over the shoulder, whatever she had to do to keep this toy away from her sibling, away from her sister, she would do it. And if it came to it, if it looked like she was going to lose it, she would just scream her head off. And then the older one would walk away, right? But that was her way of saying, I want control. This is mine. This is what I want to do at this time. And we're just born that way. We come into the world with this sense of, I need to have control. And that's not always a bad thing. I mean, there are times where we need control. There are times where if, if you're an adult, if you have kids and you're driving 75 miles an hour down I-25 and your five-year-old says, can I take the wheel? No, you need to keep control, right? <laughs> that is something you don't want to give up control of. There are certain times where you need control in life, but the problem is when the desire for control starts controlling us. That's where we run into issues. That's where we run into problems, where the desire for control starts controlling us. And we all deal with this, whether it's you know parent-child <coughs> relationships or spouse relationships. Have you ever thought about the fact that when two people get married, they come together and stand in front of a whole group of people, a whole group of witnesses, and basically what they say to each other in their vows is, I won't try to control everything, okay? If you don't try to control everything, I won't try to control everything. And that's our vows to each other. We're going to do the best we can to, to, to live in a way that we're mutually submissive to each other, right? There's a reason we have to do that. There's a reason we have to come together publicly and say, I'm giving up some control here. Because we just don't do it on our own very well. Every one of us struggle with this to some degree. Um, and, and what we're going to see in 1 Samuel today is we're going to see that this is not unique to us either. This is something that's been happening throughout the history of the world. And in fact, in this situation today, the people of Israel are going to come to God and they're basically going to say, God, we don't want you controlling us anymore. We're tired of you telling us what to do. Guys, this is a huge issue. Not only is it a huge issue when we talk about wanting control over situations or wanting control over things, but when we talk about wanting to control the things that God says he is in control of, that's when it becomes a really big issue. In fact, if you were, were just to kind of boil down what Christianity is all about, it really starts right here. This is where all of faith starts, because if we can't come to the point where we say, I surrender to God, we're not really ever believers. We're not ever really walking out our faith. So this is a huge issue. And we're going to ask the question as we walk through this, how do we get out of this, this game of thrones where every once in a while the, the desire for control sits on the throne and live in a way that is healthy and right? So 1 Samuel chapter 8 is where we are. And just to, to give you a reminder of the background here as we jump into this. Just to give you a historical background first, this is happening, again, around the year 1150 B.C., 1150 years before Jesus ever comes to earth. So long time ago, right? 3,100 years ago for us. Long time ago. But like I said, they're dealing with the same things that we deal with. And you'll see that in just a second. In, in history of the Bible, um, in terms of where this falls, there's a period... If you are here last week, we talked about this, but there's a period that's known as the period of the judges. Um, and during the period of the judges, Israel turns away from God. They walk away from God. And God uses these people known as judges to kind of bring them back to him. So if you went to, to church as a kid, you may have heard stories of Samson or, or Deborah or Gideon. Those are the judges. Eventually, we're going to get to the kings, like King David, King Saul. But Samuel is the, in the bridge in the middle of those two things. He's the last judge that's leading into the kings. Uh, so, so that's what's happening here historically. But as we get to this point, what God has been saying to the people of Israel over and over and over again is he has been telling them, don't be like the people around you. Don't be like the nations around you. When I take you into the promised land, don't adopt their practices. That's the one big thing that he keeps telling them. I mean, from like Deuteronomy through Joshua and Judges, all of this he's saying, don't be like the people around you. And that may sound like kind of harsh, 
That may sound like, well, why would you say that, God? But why he's saying that is because the people in the nations around them worship false gods. They worship gods that are not real gods. And the worship of these gods leads them absolutely in the wrong direction in life. So just, just to give you an overview of that quickly, there was a god that was worshipped in Canaan at this time called Baal. Any of you guys ever heard of Baal before? All right, so Baal is he's kind of a male god, and he's the god of the weather. He's the god of the storm. So if you wanted to have a good crop, if, you, if your family wanted to make money from your crop, you would go pray to Baal, who is the god of the weather. So in some ways, he's like the fertility god of the soil, of the land. Um, he's that type of fertility god. And then, at the same time, a lot of these people who are worshiping Baal worship a god called Ashtoreth. Ashtoreth is almost like the female version of Baal. Um, she is also a god of fertility, but fertility in a little different sense. So if you went to the temple of Ashtoreth, what you would do is you would take your money and you would give Ashtoreth your money. And as you did, you were given kind of some options. There would be all of these prostitutes standing there. And basically you had your choice at that particular time. Sounds like a great religion, right? Go, go to the temple prostitutes, pay money, and that's worship. And, and that's what they did. And so she was the god of fertility for people. He was, Baal was the god of fertility for the land. And that's the gods that they were worshiping. And, and the real god, the living god, was saying, if you follow the path of these gods, it is just going to mess you up. <laughs> If you go pay your, your tithe or whatever to the Asherah and you participate in that, it is going to cause you heartache. It is going to cause you problems, so don't do it. There was another god that was called Molech, and apparently Molech was a little bit more demanding um, in terms of what he asked. And, and so if Molech was mad or upset or whatever, there were times where people would actually take their children and throw them into the fire to sacrifice them to this God, Molech. And the living God is coming to the people of Israel and he's saying, you don't want that. <laughs> that is not good. That is not the way that life is supposed to go. Stay away from those people's practices. Don't become like the nations around you. Can you guess what the people of Israel want to do at this point? They want to be like the nations around them. <laughs> They're kind of looking at God and saying, well, you've always told us these things, but we never tried any of them. How do we know that that's true until we try it out for ourselves, right? How do we know that you're not just telling us this to keep us away from gods that are really good, that kind of thing? Um, and so they're coming to God and they're saying, we kind of want to be like the nations around us. So let's look at this together. 1 Samuel chapter 8, starting in verse 1, it says this. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. So, again, just the scenario, Samuel's kind of the, the national leader to some degree. He's the judge who's been bringing them back to God. And now he has sons that are adults, and, and he's, he's preparing these sons to be the next leaders of Israel. Uh, verse 2, the name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. Let's just hit pause for a second there to kind of wrap our minds around what's going on. So they, the, the nation of Israel is, is not formed under a central government here. They don't have the Republicans and the Democrats and the Tea Party. And it kind of sounds nice, right? Maybe we should go back to this. They didn't have any of that. They had 12 tribes, and among the 12 tribes, there were leaders. They, the tribes had family leaders and, and guys that they called elders. And at one point in time, these elders come together, and they have a meeting to talk about Samuel. It's never good when people come together and have a meeting about you, right? And, but they do. They talk about Samuel. They say, we don't really want his sons to be our leaders. And then they go to Samuel's home to announce this to Samuel. Uh, just imagine that. Imagine if your coworkers got together and had a meeting about you. That's probably not a good thing. And then they come to your home and knock on your door unexpectedly. 
they're probably not there to throw a party, right? If they've been talking about you and now they show up at your home and want to talk to you about something, it's usually not a good thing. And that's what's happening here. The leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel come together, come to the home of Samuel and say, we need to talk. And this is what they say to him in verse 5. They said to him, you are old. Just personal advice here. <laughs> if you were going to start a conversation with somebody, probably not the best thing to start with here. You are old. You know, that doesn't really win them over to your side really easy. But that's how they start. They come to Samuel and say, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead this such as all the other nations have. Do you see what they're doing? They're saying exactly what we've been talking about. They're saying, God, you've been so controlling. You've been telling us what to do, and we're tired of you telling us what to do. We want to make our own decisions. We want to be like the other nations around us. Verse 6 says, but when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Uh, a couple of things happening here. First of all, it's amazing to me that God doesn't just say, well, tough. I'm the one in charge. You're going to do what I want to do. He doesn't do that, though. He actually says, I'm going to let you decide. I'm going to let you make the decision. Um, and, and after that, after he tells them, that he's going to let them make a decision. He speaks kind of directly to Samuel and says, Samuel, you're pouting because you don't think they want your sons to be the next leaders, and maybe that's true, and maybe you weren't the best parent ever, Samuel, but he says it's not about you. Samuel, it's about me. They're not rejecting you and your family. They're rejecting me as their king, as their leader. So God uh, tells Samuel those things. Uh, in verse 8, he says, As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, Forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. In other words, he's saying, Samuel, look, man, if you would have been alive a long time ago, you would understand that from the moment I brought these people out of Egypt, from the moment I called them my own, this is what they have always done. They have always wanted to be in control. They have a problem of wanting to be in control says, this is the way it has always worked. And, and isn't this so true of us, guys? Isn't this so true of the way that life works for us? It's like I said, we don't have to be taught from birth to want to control things. We come out of the womb wanting to control things. And God is saying, these people came out of Egypt from the time that I called them my own, wanting to be in control. This is exactly what we do. This is why parents and kids, just like we talked about, kids act like they want to run away even though they have no idea how bad that would be on them. They act like they want to run away because they want control. And parents look at those kids, and, and we say the same cliche things over and over again, right? We say, my way or the highway, or if you're under my roof, you're under my rules, that kind of stuff. Do you know what both sides are saying there? The kids and the parents, they're both saying... I want to have some control. I want to be the one in charge. We have this issue that we wrestle with. Same thing again with spouses. Eventually, there's a point in marriages where, where one spouse kind of comes to the other one and says, maybe I should be the one that handles the money here. You know, I've seen how you spend. I've seen how you do that. Maybe I should be the one to handle the money. Or they come to the, the other spouse and they say, maybe I should be the one to handle the kids and the discipline and that stuff because I'm not so sure you're doing really well at this right now, you know? And, and they come to them and basically what they're saying is, I think I should have more control here. And then eventually it hits kind of the, the apex, the climax, where one spouse comes to the other one and says, will you please give me the remote control? You should not be controlling this TV, right? And there's this whole debate over who should have the remote control or where it should be in the bedroom or in the den or whatever so that a certain person can control it. That's, that's all of life for us, whether it's siblings or spouses or parents and kids or whether it's us with coworkers or friends, we're always kind of jockeying for control. We're always going back and forth trying to get a little more than we had before, a little more control. 
And again, God says control is not a bad thing, but when the desire for control is controlling you, that's when it becomes an issue. And, and guys, again, like we stated earlier, not only is it an issue when we want to control things or situations, but it becomes a huge issue when we say, God, I want to control the things that you're in charge of. I want to be in control of the things that you are running right now. Let me ask you guys another question, and, and don't raise your hands on this. This is not one that we necessarily like to answer out loud. And this is something that happens after we get a little older. So not when you're 12 and under, but when you get a little older. Have you ever wanted to or tried to run away from God? And by that, I mean, have you ever had a time where you didn't necessarily say, God, I don't believe in you anymore, I'm going to be an atheist, and forgive you. It wasn't that kind of thing, but maybe you looked at God and God was saying, you need to be really careful with the way that you handle money, because money can be a God. And you said, well, yeah, but if you just look that way for a little while, God, I think I need to go this direction for a little while, just let me be in control of the money thing, because that matters to me, that matters to our family, and I'm not so sure if what you're saying is good for our family, so we run away from God. Maybe you had a point in life where you felt like God was calling you to serve in a church, and you said, um, no, <laughs> I think you got the wrong person here, God. This is totally not me. I'm not supposed to be doing that. And so, God, if you don't mind, you can just, you know, ask somebody else. But I'm going to go this way with my life instead. And we run away from God. Or we look at God and he says, the way that you're being selfish is actually harmful to you and your family right now. And we look at him and we say, I know what you're saying, God, but... If you'll just let me go this direction, I'll work this out. I'll take care of this. I'll make it work the way it's supposed to work. I think all of us do that. All of us have these moments where we look at God and we say, I want control. I need to be in charge sometimes. And God says, I'm telling you, I know what's coming. And if you don't pay attention, you're going to run into a mess listen to me. That's what he's pleading with the people of Israel over here. In verse 9 he goes on as he's speaking to Samuel and he says, now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who would reign over them will do. Like we just implied, part of what God is saying here is he's saying I need you to trust me. I am God. I can actually tell you what's coming down the road. And if you will just listen to me, I will show you what is going to happen if you want the king to be the ruler over you. If you'll just pay attention to what I'm saying, you will understand why I'm telling you not to do this. That's what God is saying. So he says to Samuel, just tell them. Tell them what it's going to be like when they have a king. And this is what Samuel does in verse 10. It says, Samuel told all the words the Lord, of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said... This is what the king who will reign over you will do. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his, his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. God's saying to them, if you want a king over you, I'm not going to stop you. But you need to know that it is going to cost you. If you have sons, it's going to cost you your sons. Your sons are going to end up in the military. And you're, the king is going to take your sons to do his work for him. And they kind of looked at it and said, well, yeah, but we need a military. And we still have our daughters, right? They're, they're taken care of. They're protected. Everything's good. And Samuel goes on in verse 13 and says, he will take away your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. God's saying, you have this control issue going on right now. 
and you have some things under your control. You've got cattle, you've got donkey, you've got these things. If you go this direction, guess what's going to happen? The few things that you're controlling right now, you're not going to have control over those anymore. The king is going to take them from you, your servants, your cattle, your donkeys, and he's going to use them for himself. Verse 17, he will take a tenth of your flocks and your, you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king that you have chosen. And the Lord will not answer you in that day. I don't know about you, but you read that and it almost feels harsh, right? It almost feels like God's saying, I'm turning my back on you. And when you go down this road, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to answer your prayer. But here's what he's really saying. He's saying, I'm telling you in advance what's going to happen. And if you choose to walk down this road... I am not going to just pluck you out before you walk through the consequences. See, and if you choose to walk down this road, you're going to have to deal with the consequences that you have chosen. And, and so he just sets them up. He tells them, you can choose. You can choose me as your king. You can choose me as your leader. Or you can have Republicans and Democrats. And you can have a centralized government. You can have a king. You can have it your way if you choose that. But just know what's coming. Just know the consequences that you're going to walk through if you make that decision. Um, and, and so he gives it back to them. And once again in verse 19, this is their response. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations. For the king to lead us and go out before us to fight our battles. So again, they just reiterate, we're tired of you telling us what to do, God. We want to do what we want to do. We want to follow the other nations around us. We want to be like them. And, and you know what essentially they're saying here? They're saying, yeah, you're God. And yeah, we've heard these stories about people coming out of Egypt and the sea party. We've heard all of that stuff. But we just don't trust that what you're saying is really true. That's ultimately what they're saying. We, we just don't trust that you know, money will end up being a god to us. We don't trust that. We can handle that. It's not that big of a deal. Right? We don't trust that if we act like the nations around us, we're going to end up following their practices and get into the mess that they do. We just don't <coughs> trust that god. And so ultimately they're saying to God, we just really don't believe what you're saying. Again, we would never say that to God out loud. <laughs> we would never come to God and say, no, I don't think you're telling me the truth. No, I don't think you can handle this. I don't think I trust you in it. But with our lives, with the decisions that we make, sometimes we say exactly the same thing. In verse 21, just finishing out the chapter, it says, When Samuel heard that all the people, uh, when Samuel heard all that the people had said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the men of Israel, everyone go back to this town. Kind of like the dad there at that point where he's just saying, just get out of here. <laughs> you know, you're going to do what you're going to do. You go do it on your own. But don't do it in my house, right? You get out of here. Um, and the people of Israel just confirm what they confirmed all along and that we have a control problem. We need to be in control of this. We need for God to surrender to what we want to do for a little while. Guys, like I've said a few times, this is nothing new. Um, in fact, if you go to the Ten Commandments, you remember the Ten Commandments where God starts giving in the law, the ten big things, right? He starts, the very first thing he starts with is he starts with this statement. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. And our temptation is to think, okay, that means as long as I don't, you know, carve some little crazy thing and start bowing down to it, I'm good, right? As long as I don't do that, I can still kind of do what I want and, and everything's fine. But what God is saying is he's saying you're going to have these times where you are going to be controlled by the desire for control. You're going to have these times where you want to take over as God. He says you are not to have any gods, including yourself including your passions, including your desires that you put ahead of me. This, this has always been a problem. And God 
has always been saying, if you would just trust that I am God, and that I know what's coming down the road, it would make so many decisions for you so much easier. If you would just trust that what I am telling you is the truth, it would make this so much easier for you. And I believe what God is saying to, to Samuel, I believe he's, what he's saying to the Israelites, and what he's saying to us is really all the same thing. I, I think what he is saying to us is he's saying the will of God is exactly what you would choose if you knew what he knows. I think he's telling us that if, if you understood what I understand, you would want to go the direction that I'm telling you. To go. If you trusted what I'm telling you I know right now, then you would want to choose the things that I'm telling you to choose in this moment. The will of God is exactly what we would choose if we knew what he knows. I think that's the whole summary of what we are learning in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And so the question becomes, okay, if, if this is the answer, if it's following the will of God, what do I need to do to stop this game of thrones where control takes over in my life? What I need to do to get off this merry-go-round ride? And, and the answer is really pretty simple, guys, right? It's not necessarily what we want to hear, but it's pretty simple. The answer is this. We just have to surrender our will to the will of God. We just have to surrender to the point where we say, God, I trust you more than I trust me. It sounds simple, right? It's not so simple, but it sounds simple. And that's what God says. If you want to follow me, if you want to get off this game of thrones, if you want to have clarity, and if you want me to be the one giving you directions, here, here's what you do. You just surrender. And like we mentioned earlier, guys, this is where faith starts. This is the starting point, the point where we come to God and we say, I'm not getting it right on my own. I need you to be the leader. I need you to be the one to help me make these decisions. That's where faith starts, and that's where we get off this game of thrones, where control is always an issue. At another point in the book of Samuel, um, there's a story told about the, the, the people actually coming back to God. And, and they do this a few times. So in one particular time where they come back to God, they come back and they have a ceremony to basically say, we never want to walk away from you again. Um, and the way that they do this, the ceremony that they go through, if you just read through it, it looks really funny in the Bible because you, you don't get any explanation of why they do the things that they do. I mean, it just tells us that they do this. So here's what they do. They get everybody together. They gather around essentially as a nation, everybody that's saying, we want to follow God and follow God alone. And they take a big jar of water huge pitcher of water. And the way that they express what they want to do is they take that water and they just pour it out on the ground. And you may say, what in the world does that have to do with following God? What does that mean? Why would they take a jar of water and pour it out on the ground? Well, it's symbolic. And what they're saying, I believe, is that water essentially represents the things that they are controlling in life. And they take it and they pour it out on the ground. And let me ask you a question. When you pour out a pitcher of water on the ground, how long is it going to take you to gather all of that back up and get it back in the pitcher? <laughs> Probably not going to be able to do it, right? <laughs> um, that, that doesn't work that way. And that's the point. The point is we are surrendering the things that we have been controlling. We are turning these over and we understand that God... You are going to be in control and we're not. We can't gather this back up and stick it back in. They're saying, God, we trust you more than we trust us to be in control. That's the whole point of the ceremony. And guys, what, what I want us to do as we go through this week, as we make this app close, we live this out. I want you to have a way hold on to this so that when these moments come up throughout this week where you say, oh, I want control or I think I need to take over, when you have those moments and God is clearly saying, you don't need to be in control. You don't need to be hanging on to this. You can say, okay, here's my reminder. I'm not in control any longer. So when you walked in the doors earlier, you probably saw on the table that's in the, uh, in the lobby area, that there are all these little cups of water. 
they're just like, you know, they're these, same as the communion cups, it's like a thimble of water, right? Um, and so here's what I want you to do on your way out of this place today. As you leave the building, I want you to grab one of those cups of water. And as you walk out, I want you just to go out with a prayer on your heart and your lip where you're looking at that water and you know the things that you're trying to control where God doesn't want you to control those. I just want you to say a quick prayer to God. Just silently just say, God, I'm surrendering this to you, whatever this is to you. I'm surrendering this to your control. And I don't want to die. And I want you to take that water outside and just pour it out as a reminder that I can't take this back. This is God's. I'm giving this to him. This is his from now on. You say, well, what do I do with that little cup? Because now I'm stuck with this cup. Here's what you do with the cup. You take it home and you put it on your nightstand or you put it beside your bed and you put it somewhere you can see it so that all week throughout the week as you look up when you see that cup, when you want to take control back, when you want to take over, when you want to do your way rather than God's way, you see the cup sitting there. And it's just a reminder, I've given this away. I've given this to God. I am not the one. Will you guys do that with me? We get ready to leave. And guys, it, it's going to be different for all of us. For, for some people, this is going to be a, you know what? I have to surrender control of my family. I have tried to dictate everything. I've tried to make it the way that I want it, but I need God to be the leader of my household. For, for some of us, it's going to be, you know what? I know God has been saying I shouldn't be in this relationship. Look at this person. I want to be in this relationship. And this is going to be the time when we say, God, I'm not going to force my will. I'm giving this to you. For some of us, it's going to be the money thing that we talked about where we say, you know what? I know that money has been a driving force for me. I know that wealth and material possessions, that's been the thing that's been holding me back. That's where I'm running away from God. And today, it's going to be the day where we say, God, I'm giving this to you. I was never supposed to be in control of this decision. It's going to be different for all of us in here. Everyone, it may be a relationship, it may be a thing, it may be a situation, but you have something just like I have something where we need to come to God and say, maybe not with everything in life today, but with this area, I need to surrender this to you. I need to give this to you and not. Guys, I really believe, absolutely believe, that if we knew what God knows, we would choose His way every time. The will of God is exactly what we would choose if we knew what He knows. So let's just confess today that we want your will more than ours. Father, thank you so much for your patience with us. Thank you for your love toward us. Thank you that when we turn our back, when we run away, when we mess up, when we sin, that you don't walk away from us. Father, we know you don't always save us from the consequences, but we also know that just like the father of the prodigal son, you sit and you wait and you watch and you hope that we'll come back. God, help us today as we come to a place where we just pour out everything in terms of control. Say that we don't need to be the ones making the decisions any longer. But you need to be in control. God, help us not just to say that with our words, not just to say that with a cup of water. Help us to say that with our lives. Help us to live this out day after day. We love you so much, and we pray these things in the power of your name, Jesus.